What up, y'all? It's your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mel, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio, live from Dubai for Wednesday, November 2nd, 2016, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, on Twitter at the Enter Report, or on Instagram at the Entertainment Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com, or your iHeart phone app, search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Tim Miller, the filmmaker behind Fox's smash hit Deadpool, has signed on to help Sony develop a film based on the iconic video game character Sonic the Hedgehog. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Miller has joined the production as executive producer alongside his longtime collaborator Jeff Fowler, who is making his feature directorial debut with the film. Miller and Fowler work together at Blurred Studios, a company co-founded by Miller that is known for creating animated shorts and cutscenes in video games. Miller said in a statement, Jeff is an incredible director with a strong story instincts. The world of Sonic presents the perfect opportunity for Jeff to leverage his experience in animation to bring new dimensions to this iconic character. The pair are joined by Fast and Furious producer Neil H. Moritz and Patrick Casey and Josh Miller, who are penning the script. Sonic, who will celebrate his 25th anniversary in June, when the film was first announced, made his first appearance on the Sega Genesis in 1991. The game involved Sonic and his partners Tails and Knuckles as they followed the plans of the Egg Dr. Eggman. The Miller's involvement with the film comes after he exited Deadpool 2 over creative differences with star Ryan Reynolds. Director Rick Famuyiwa has exited Warner Bros. upcoming superhero epic The Flash as pre-production is underway. According to Variety, signing sources close to the studio and Famuyiwa, the filmmaker departed the project over creative differences. Known for helming 2015 Sundance favorite dope, Famuyiwa released a statement on his departing noting, When I was approached by Warner Bros. in DC about the possibility of directing The Flash, I was excited about the opportunity to enter this amazing world of characters that I love growing up and still do to this day. He also added, I was also excited to work with Ariza Miller, who is a phenomenal young actor. I pitched a version of the film in line with my voice, humor, and heart. While it's disappointing that we couldn't come together creatively on the project, I remain grateful for the opportunity. I'll continue to look for opportunities to tell stories and speak to a fresh generational, topical, and multicultural point of view. I wish Warner Brothers, DC, John Berg, Jeff Johns, and Ariza Miller all the best as they continue their journey into the Speed Force. Filming on The Flash was set to begin in early 2017, with Miller appearing alongside dope star Kersey Clemens as love interest Iris West and Billy Crudup in the key role. Production could be delayed, however, Miller will appear as the Scarlet Speedster in Warner Brothers Justice League on November 17th. Family Yiwa is the second to depart The Flash following the exit of Seth Graham Smith, who was set to make his directorial debut with the film after writing popular novels Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter before adapting them into screen plays. Graham Smith has written a script based on a treatment from Phil Lord and Christopher Miller. James Cameron has promised to push new film innovations and technology in his upcoming sequels to Avatar. Filmmaker said Friday, according to The Hollywood Reporter, as he accepted the honorary membership into the Society of Motion Pictures and Television Engineers, joining the ranks of Walt Disney, Ray Dolby, and George Lucas, I'm going to push not only for better tools, workflow, high dynamic range, and high frame rates, the things we are working towards. He says, I'm still very bullish on 3D, but we need brighter projections, and ultimately I think it can happen with no glasses, we'll get there. He also said before noting Muse, a movie, magic has to amaze, and that involves constant creation of new tools and techniques. The audience's eyes adjust to what we did, and so we need to up our work. Special effects pioneer Douglas Trumbull was also honored by the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Currently, Cameron is set to have four sequels planned for his Smash sci-fi series that first was released in 2009. Speaking with The Hollywood Reporter on the red carpet to the event, Cameron spoke further on his intentions to present Avatar sequels at a higher frame rate, noting, I think high frame rates is a tool, not a format. I think it's something you want to weave in and out and use when it soothes the eye, especially in 3D during panning, movements that create artifacts that I find very bothersome. I want to get rid of that stuff, and you can do it through high frame rates. He says movie are going to look better than they've ever looked. They already do, and they are going to continue to look better. Anything we can imagine, we can put it on the screen. 
Actor Vin Diesel unveiled on Facebook Tuesday a new two-and-a-half-minute trailer for his upcoming action picture, Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage. A press release from Paramount Pictures says the new trailer is here, get ready to enter the Xander zone. In Facebook first, Vin Diesel launched a new trailer simultaneously across more than 70 Facebook pages live. Other cast members joined the Facebook live stream via drop-in videos from around the world. Directed by DJ Caruso and starring Deprika Padukone, Donnie Yang, Tony Ya, Nina Dubrev, Roy McCann, and Samuel L. Jackson. The movie is to open nationwide on January 20th. It is a sequel to 2002's Triple X and 2005's Triple X State of the Union. Johnny Depp has signed on to co-star in the sequel to this month's Harry Potter prequel, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Scheduled to open November 18th, the J.K. Rowling Penn fantasy flick features Eddie Redmayne as mazoologist Newt Scalamander. The first installment in the five-movie franchise is set in 1920s New York. The Hollywood Reporter revealed the news of Depp's casting in the second movie Tuesday, but emphasized no details were available about who Depp will play. The Pirates of the Caribbean icon will also have a brief cameo in the first installment of the Beast series the entertainment industry trade newspaper Variety has set. In an interview with Michael Strahan on Good Morning America, director Mel Gibson calls Hacksaw Ridge the pinnacle of heroism. The, based on a true story, Hacksaw Ridge tells his tale of Desmond Dawes, a conscientious objector who was drafted and sent to the Battle of Okinawa but refused to fight. He said Dawes set out to protect his fellow soldiers. Gibson says he saved their lives without firing a single weapon. He chose the higher route, which is pretty high indeed. Strahan joked he took the high road in a serious dangerous way. Spider-Man star Andrew Garfield plays Dawes in the role Gibson says he inhabits perfectly. He says he did such a great job. I'm really proud of him. I like to work with this guy all the time. He's amazing. The film, which has, according to Strahan, is generating Oscar buzz, is open in theaters on November 4th. Val Chemerinsky shed happy tears for Dancing with the Stars partner Lori Hernandez, saying he didn't want to blow it for her. Chemerinsky said through tears during rehearsal, it's crazy how fast life moves. Lori, she brings the joy in everything. I just don't want to blow it for her. For me, by sharing it with her, it lives on forever. <coughs> Hernandez, in an attempt to cheer him up, suggested he eat some spaghetti. He says, I'm not upset. I'm happy. I'm really happy. These are happy tears. I want to be good to you, for you, and make this a great, great experience for you, always because you deserve it. The duo earned a perfect score Monday on Monday night's show with their uh, by dancing the Viennese waltz, which was set to the tune of Pure Imagination from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Happy Days veterans Ron Howard, Marion Ross, Anson Williams, and Don Moss are to appear on an upcoming episode of The Odd Couple, CBS announced. Also expected to pop up on the Star Study November 7th edition of the show are Penny Marshall and Cindy Williams from Laverne and Shirley and pa- Pam Dobler from Mork and Mindy. All of the actors saw their careers ro- skyrocketed on shows created by the late Gary Marshall, who developed and was the executive producer of the original television version of The Odd Couple and served as executive consultant on the current incarnation. Marshall played Oscar's father, Walter, in the remake as well. He died in July at the age of 81. Next week's installment will pay tribute to Marshall by showing Oscar, played by Matthew Perry, as he reconnects with significant people from Walter's life while attempting to realize his father's final wish to have his ashes spread behind the candy factory he used to work on. Executive producer Bob Daly said in a statement Monday, The writing staff and everyone in the Odd Couple reboot was thrilled when Gary Marshall joined us as a producer because his shows were part of our TV DNA. He was a kind, generous presence on the set, and we loved him dearly. And when we lost him, we knew we had to do something to honor his legacy, something that, like Gary's work, was both heartfelt and zany. We're so grateful that the stars of these classic shows are able to join us in honoring him. Michael Shannon and Taylor Kish have landed the lead roles in Waco, a six-part event series to air on Spike TV. Production of the program is to begin in the spring. It's based on the harrowing Texas set true story of the 1993 FBI siege of the Waco compound belonging to the Branch Davidians, a religious sect which resulted in a deadly shootout and fire. Shannon will play FBI negotiator Gary Noonster, while Kirsch will play infamous cult leader David Koresh. Harvey Weinstein, the producer and co-chairman of the Weinstein Company, said in a statement, We've been working with our friend Kevin Kay at Spike for years. He has a rare gift for, a gift for creating quality scripted television with commercial appeal, and when he shared his vision for both the program and his goals for the network, I knew we had found the perfect partner. Waco is a provocative series where the drama and excitement are amplified by the truth and the history surrounding the event, along with a cast of amazing actors, including the incredible Michael Shannon and Taylor Kish. We are also looking forward to working with Sharon Levy and her team to bring this story to life. 
NBC says it has ordered a full season of its freshman sci-fi drama, Timeless. Jeffrey Salk, the president of NBC Entertainment, said in a statement, Timeless is a phenomenal new show that takes the audience emotionally to a completely different place and time each week. We're thrilled to be ordering additional episodes so that we can run the final six hours of the season in a row with no preem- preemptions after the new year. Our hats are off to Eric Cripple and Sean Ryan for producing one of the most ambitious new shows anywhere on television. The Time Hopping series, which now includes 16 episodes, stars Abigail Spencer, Matt Latner, Malcolm Barrett, Goran Vishnik, Patterson Joseph, Sakina Jaffrey, and Claudia Dumit. The Bachelor Season 21 will premiere in 2017. The ABC reality competition announced in a press release Tuesday that former Bachelorette and Bachelor in Paradise contestant Nick Vile will renew his search for love on the show in January. Uh, The release reads, after all these years and all the heartbreak, it's finally Nick's turn to turn hand out the roses. Will he finally find the love he craved? He believes in finding love on the series and hopes it is his time now. Val was a run-up on both The Bachelorette Season 10 with Andy Durfman and Season 11 with Caitlin Bristow. He later finished 7th and 8th place on The Bachelor in Paradise in Season 3. Uh, the 35-year-old technology salesman wrote on Instagram, Still on my journey, but breaking my silence to share with you all I can see it for yourselves. Get ready. It all starts January 2nd. Hashtag The Bachelor. Hashtag The Bachelor ABC. Hashtag January 2nd. At The Bachelor ABC. K Plus 8 teases big changes to come for Kate Gosselin and her family in the new trailer Monday. TLC series released a preview for the show's forthcoming season. Sees Gosselin handle her sextuplet's 12th birthday, new puppies, and other exhausting challenges. 41 year old reality star tweeted, Yep, it's true. An all new season of hashtag K Plus 8 starts on November 22nd at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Kids, get your homework done so mom lets you stay up to watch. The new season will open with the 10th anniversary special November 22nd. The episode will take a look back over the years with never-before-seen footage, new interviews with the family, according to the press release. Uh, The release reads, From mealtime to school day prep to one-on-one time with mom and sibling rivalries, Kate and her kids have adjusted to fit the growing needs of a tight-knit unit. They discuss some of their fondest moments and also share how close they have become. Gosselin shares eight children, 16-year-old twins, Kara and Maddie and 12-year-old sextuplets Aiden, Alexis, Colin, Hannah, Joel, and Leah with ex-husband John Gosselin. The family show originally debuted as John and Kate Plus 8 in 2007, but was renamed after the couple's divorce. The Tanners are back to celebrate the holidays in the first trailer of Season 2 of Netflix's Full House revival, Fuller House. The clip released Tuesday features DJ played by Candace Cameron Burke, Stephanie played by Jody Sweeten, and Kimmy played by Andrea Barber, hosting the rest of their large family inside their packed San Francisco home to celebrate Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Eve. Among the holiday fun, Stephanie is seen unknowingly getting together with Kimmy's younger brother, Jimmy, and DJ finally making a decision between Matt, played by John Brotherton, and Steve, played by Scott Winger, but not before they both announce they have new girlfriends. Kimmy jokes that poor thing is a lifetime movie waiting to happen. Classic characters from Full House, Uncle Jesse, played by John Stamos, Uncle Joy, played by Dave Coulier, and Danny Tanner, played by Bob Sackett, who is going through a midlife crisis at 60, also make appearances. Danny explains to TJ, I just turned 60, and I just start thinking... What is it all about? She responds back, we're what it's all about. Fuller House Season 2 is set to premiere on Netflix starting December 9th. Universal Orlando has unveiled new details about Race Through New York starring Jimmy Fallon, an attraction slated to open at the theme park this spring. Press release really explained, guests will get up close and personal with the show's most hilarious segments before taking off on a wild and action-packed race through New York against Jimmy Fallon himself. The attraction will also feature cameos by faces like Sarah from EW, Jimmy and Tight Pants, Tonight Show announcer Stephen Higgins, and Grammy Award winning Bang the Roots, who are also the musical masterminds behind the original attraction score. Designers to look for at like NBC Studios, the waiting area of the ride will showcase significant moments in the 62 year history of The Tonight Show and will feature real props and set pieces from the late night chat program. Guests will also get the chance to enjoy a performance from the Ragtime Gal Barbershop Quartet in the Studio 6 Beat Club and to interact with the Tonight Show mascot, Hashtag the Panda. Ride itself is built as the world, world's first ever flying theater, which seats up to 72 audience members for their thrilling race against Jimmy Fallon. Uh, the release noted, the race will take guests through the streets of New York City and all the way to the moon and back. They'll encounter iconic landmarks from the Statue of Liberty to the Empire State Building to everything in between. 
right as replacing the old twister attraction, which closed down last fall. Kim Kardashian returned to social media Monday in the wake of her armed robbery. The 36-year-old rally star shared a photo and a couple Halloween-related posts on Facebook nearly a month after being robbed at gunpoint in Paris. Kardashian first posted a picture of herself relaxing and looking at her phone writing downtime, hashtag Lumi collab. The Snapchat appears to be an old photo as the star's Blackberry Bold, which died in August, can be seen in her lap. The Keeping Up with the Kardashian star followed by sharing a link to an article on her website about last-minute Halloween, uh, Halloween costumes. She also reposted a childhood video of herself and sister's Courtney Kardashian that Courtney had shared online. Courtney wrote, uh, I love that we had so much video footage of our childhood because my dad loved filming us. This one is from Halloween 1982, made for such an amazing memories to look back on. I have clearly been into dressing up as Wonder Woman for a really long time. Kardashian was at her hotel in Paris on October 2nd when two men gained entry to her room and stole her phone and millions of dollars worth of jewelry. She has since retreated from the spotlight and is yet to make a statement about the incident. Source told Entertainment Tonight in October, Kim is still very shaken up about the entire situation. She doesn't feel ready to talk about it. The entire added right now, she's still focused on trying to feel better about the whole situation. Kim is at home with her kids, North and Sane in Los Angeles. Her mom, Chris, and sisters visit her regularly. They've been great and supporting her in every way they can. Courtney herself celebrated Halloween on Saturday with half sister Kylie Jenner, who channeled Christina Aguilera's dirty music video. Courtney also threw a party last week with daughter Penelope Disick and close friends in attendance. Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, and The Weeknd have been booked to perform on the Victoria's Secret's fashion show CBS announced Tuesday. The lingerie runaway show, which will film in Paris for the first time, is scheduled to broadcast December 5th. Yeah, the past release cheese, merging fashion, fantasy, and entertainment, the lingerie runaway show will include pink carpet interviews, model profiles, and a behind-the-scenes look at the making of the shows in the City of Lights. The all-star lineup of Victoria's Secret Angels will include returning favorites Adriana Lima, Alessandra Ambrosio, Lily Aldridge, Elsa Hosh, Jasmine Tooks, who will be wearing the $3 million Bright Night fantasy bra, Josephine Screever, Lays Roberto, Martha Hunt, Romy Striden, Sarah Sampio, Stella Maxwell, and Taylor Hill, as well as 37 of the world's best-known runaway stars, including Carly Claus and Bella and Gigi Hadid. And speaking of Lady Gaga, she has channeled her Joanne album cover for arrival in Japan on Tuesday. Thirty-year-old American singer wore a pink hat to greet fans at the Nariti International Airport outside Tokyo, head of her performance of the Japanese morning show Sukiri. Uh, Lady Gaga tweeted, so many gorgeous Japanese angels at the airport waiting for me. I love your hats and joyful spirit. We're back monsters. Get ready for hashtag Joanne. She added, wish I could sign and take pictures with every single one of you. Ashimasu, Japan, love and peace. I can't wait to sing for you on TV. Hashtag Joanne. Joanne debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 albums charts in October and also topped the charts in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Lady Gaga previously performed on Sakiri in 2013 and will return to the show Wednesday morning. She teased from her hotel, I could look out this window all night, but I have to be up early for Sakiri going to sing. She later tweeted, I'm so grateful to have the number one album in Japan for the second week in a row. Can't wait to tell you the story of Hashtag Joanne. Joanne includes the singles Perfect Illusion and Million Reasons. Lady Gaga had revealed on Good Morning America last week that the album was named for her late aunt, who also inspired her middle name. She, she said she died in 1974, and the tragedy really stayed with our family our whole lives. And I wanted to make a record about family and friendships and togetherness and learn from the past, and that's why we're here today. She also added, the album isn't just country, it's folk, it's dance, it's pop, it's funk. Some of my vocal jazz influence also flies in there too. There's some rock and roll influence, but essentially it's a pop record. U2 frontman and philanthropist Bono was recently honored with Glamour's first Man of the Year award. The award, which has traditionally gone to influential and inspirational women, was given to the U2 frontman Bono on behalf of the work he has done as a global advocate for women. Uh, Melinda Gates, who won the award in 2013, said he's one of the most outspoken and effective advocates for women and girls I know. As an activist, he's using those skills to get the world talking about the fact that ending extreme poverty begins with empowering women and girls. Bono said of the honor, I'm sure I don't deserve it, but I'm grateful for this award as a chance to say the battle for gender equality can't be won unless men lead it along with women. We're largely responsible for the problems, so we have to be involved in the solutions. Christiane Ampior, the journalist and the 2005 award winner, said he has sold 170 million albums and won 22 Grammys. 
What I admire most about him is his extraordinary talents for tackling problems that seem intractable and making mighty and measurable gains. It's not every superstar, or for that matter, statesman, who can bring about $100 billion in debt cancellation for 35 of the world's most poorest countries or pursue the U.S. government to pony up the largest contribution ever for life-saving AIDS drug in Africa, as President George W. Bush did in 2004. Bono's most recent campaign, Poverty is Sexist, is tasking with helping women who survive on the less than $2 a day. He says women bear the burdens of poverty. We can do much more than we can think. Leaders are accountable to all of us. If they don't support women and girls, vote them out of office. To quote Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. And now let's take a look at what happened on the state in entertainment history. On the state in 1985, Miami Vice's soundtrack begins an 11-week run at number one. Almost from its beginning, television showed a remarkable ability to influence the pop charts, and not only by giving exposure to popular musical artists on programs like the American Bandstand and the Ed Sullivan Show. Many television programs also launched legitimate pop hits in the form of their theme songs, songs like the Peter Gunn theme, Welcome Back, and theme from SWAT. But prior to 1985, no television program had ever launched a smash hit movie-style soundtrack album. The first one to do so was NBC's Miami Vice, a show that not only altered the landscape of television and fashion, but also sent the soundtrack album of the same name to the top of the Billboard 200 albums charts on this day in 1985, a spot it would hold for the next 11 weeks. The genius, or genesis, of Miami Vice is the stuff of television legend. It came about in the form of a memo from NBC head of programming Brandon Tartikoff, in, his, in which he documented one of his brainstorms simply as MTV Cops. Inspired by MTV's growing influence on the music industry, Tarkov reasoned that a slickly produced, visually arrested cop show could become to television essentially what Duran Duran was to music. Under the creative guidance of producer Michael Mann, Tarkov's uh, vision took shape in 1984 when it debuted on NBC's fall schedule. Schedule opposite the ratings juggernaut Fountain Crest on Friday nights at 10 p.m., Miami Vice struggled in its first season but catapulted into Nielsen Top 10 in the autumn of 1985. Simultaneous with the television show's rise to popularity, its instrumental theme song by Czech composer Jan Hammer climbed to the Billboard Pop Singles charts. The popularity of that single in turn drove the sales of the soundtrack album Miami Vice, which featured not only John Hammer's theme song and other ex- examples of his inc- um, incidental soundtrack music, but also several original songs written expressly for the show's fall season, including Smuggler's Blues and You Belong to the City by Glenn Fry. The album also featured previously released songs that have been featured prominently in the program's signature musical montages, including Phil Collins in the Air Tonight and Tina Turner's Better Be Good to Me. In demonstrating how five scenes worth of difficulty expository dialogue could easily be replaced with a 90-second visual montage set to mood-appropriate pop music, Miami Vice made a significant creative impact on the future of American television. In demonstrating how much additional revenue a television show could generate by releasing soundtrack albums of pre-existing popular music, it had a significant business impact as well. And as your entertainment report for Wednesday, November 2nd, 2016, I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to deliver some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, facebook.com slash the entertainment report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, on Twitter at The Answer Report, or on Instagram at The Entertainment Report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of The Entertainment Report anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com, or your iHeart phone app, search for The Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Good night, and God bless you all.